right, we're ready to move on to paragraph number 17 now. And um, in between paragraph 16 and 17, you may notice a few, a few small changes. Number one, I've got a new shirt on or a different shirt. And then number two, in uh, to my over to my right, I've got a new picture in there as well. So uh, just adding a little variety in here. Well, paragraph number 17 in the notes, Isaiah wrote at a time of great wickedness for Israel with her ongoing deep uh, refusal to repent of her sin, though she had prophets like Isaiah warning her of a coming judgment. And in paragraph number 18, that judgment against Israel came for the, uh, the ten northern tribes of Israel in 722 B.C., when Assyria overthrew those tribes and then took them, took the people as plunder back to Assyria. Paragraph number 19, Judah refused to learn from this judgment against those 10 northern tribes uh, called Israel, <clears throat> and she also experienced God's wrath when the nation of Babylon destroyed her. Interestingly, Isaiah prophesied that Babylon would come and destroy Judah but at the time that he prophesied, Babylon wasn't even a world power. That would happen about a hundred uh, or a hundred and some odd years later. In fact, <clears throat> it happened in 605 BC. That is when Babylon um, initiated their takeover of Judah, and it took it took about 20 years for it to be complete. And so, ultimately, in 586 BC, the Babylonians. Uh, completely leveled the temple in Jerusalem. And so in paragraph 20 of that passage in Isaiah, one commentator remarks, <clears throat> he writes, the doom of the people is foretold in words that cannot be misunderstood. Again, we're referring back to Isaiah, uh, the passage that Jesus quotes in Isaiah 6, verses 9 and 10. And so he writes, the doom of the people is foretold in words that cannot be misunderstood. He adds, the guilt of the nation, as a result, stands out in bolder relief. The people are commanded to do the very thing that will bring about their ruin. You will hear and keep on hearing, but will not um, respond. So he writes, probably there is a certain amount of irony. Hear, H-E-A-R, we may envision the prophet crying, but of course you will not hear. That's really where the nation of the United States is right now. We're already at some level under the judgment of God who is turning away from our nation and not blessing our nation. And uh, people are openly and defiantly mocking him and his ways by mocking his people and by mocking the teaching and the preaching of the gospel. So uh, paragraph number 21, accordingly, there is clearly historical precedent for Jesus' words in Matthew 13 in this parable of the sower and the implicit warning to the Jews of his time that an even fiercer judgment would come upon them if they persisted in rejecting their Messiah which, of course, tragically, they did. <clears throat> Fair enough, paragraph number 22 in your notes, the words Jesus uses constitute irony. That blank there in paragraph number 22 is the word irony, which he employed many times in his teaching. You can see the, the scriptural references that I give you in that paragraph. However, paragraph number 23, now the stakes were even higher for his listeners since they were privileged to be in the very presence of their Messiah at long last. Amazing that these people could hear the sinless Son of, of God, the, their Messiah, teach and preach right in front of them, and yet their hearts could be in a condition that they wouldn't receive what he has to say. That was the case then, and it's always been the case ever since. It's the case today. 
And that's why if we, that's why the parable of the sower is so important. It deals with the condition of our hearts. If the condition of our hearts is not good, Satan will steal the word out of our hearts. Or uh, the desire for other things, pleasures, riches, cares of this world will enter in and choke out the word and it won't produce any fruit. But if our hearts are good, then we will produce fruit, 30, 60, and 100 fold. That is what God's desire is for every single person. But we have a free will and he will not override that free will. He will aid our free will to get us to the point where we want to respond to him, but he will not violate that free will. <clears throat> and consequently, we have a tremendous responsibility to hunger and thirst for him and to obey him. Well, in paragraph number 24, I write, beyond all this lies even further emphasis to the readers of the four gospels in that that passage that Jesus is quoting, Isaiah chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, is quoted in each of those Gospels, in each account of the parable of the sower, Mark 4 and Luke 8. Um, <clears throat> and also, it's even quoted in John 12, 39 through 41. That is significant when all four Gospels uh, quote from, a, from the same passage or verses in the Old Testament. Um, that, that is highly significant for us. And it's also quite unusual for one Old Testament citation to appear in all four Gospels. Moreover, paragraph number 25, Paul quotes these verses in Isaiah twice himself. In, in him speaking, Luke records him, uh, Paul speaking in Acts 28. You have the reference there, and then also Paul writes it in Romans 11. That's that's six times that Isaiah, uh, this passage in Isaiah has been quoted. Now in those quotations from Paul, as well as in uh, the gospel references, all speak, all of them speak of the rejection of God's word in Christ. Wow. Well, paragraph 26, indeed, it must come as a great surprise to the careful student of Scripture that, quote, the portion of Isaiah that is quoted most often in the New Testament is Isaiah 6, 9, and 10. The passage about the deafening, blinding, hardening effect of Isaiah's godly prophetic preaching. That is, that is really astonishing. So clearly by now, paragraph 27, we can appreciate the vast, vast importance Jesus places upon the Word of God. And then I've got some references, uh, additional references there for you in parentheses. That leads me to paragraph 28. Finally, in his commentary on Isaiah, uh, Jeffrey Grogan offers the following concerning God's judgment of Israel. He writes, we should note also that this hardening judgment was pronounced after centuries of his people's defective hearing of his word. That blank there is defective. And so it may be seen to be judicial as well as sovereign. Paragraph 29, given the severity of God's historical judgment of Israel in the Old Testament, we can now appreciate all the more Jesus warning against stubbornly rejecting him yet again, Israel's long-awaited Messiah. So, beloved, what we've done, or what I've done just now, is I have dug deeper into the historical context of the parable of the sower, the cultural context, and the literary context from the standpoint of of um, the immediate context of that parable of the sower, and then the broader context going back to the Old Testament. You see, when you, when you and I um, exercise that wonderful spiritual discipline of observing historical, cultural, and, and um, literary context, we get so much more out of Scripture. And we interpret it much, much better and we can therefore apply it much, much better. 
the the misunderstanding of of so many people is that God intentionally was hiding the truth uh, from the people. That that is just the opposite. He wanted them to respond uh, to the truth of His word, but because they didn't respond, He ultimately had to bring judgment uh, against them. They refused to respond, and that's the key that Jesus. Uh, teaches us on. Well, that leads me to paragraph number 30 in your notes. Thus, can those who later read what are seven references in total of Isaiah 6, 9 through 10, that is, that passage itself, the four Gospels, the, the verse in Acts, or the two verses in Acts, and the one in Romans, uh, can, can those of us, can those who later read what are those seven references about such judgments think that they themselves are immune to also rejecting Jesus' words or even taking them lightly. I guarantee you that far too many, and I hope it's I'm not accurate, but, but maybe the majority of Christians might pay lip service to the words of Jesus but he's not interested in lip service, is he? He is interested in a hearty obedience and a, and a taking in of his word and living it out uh, as he wants us to. So that leads me to an application in paragraph 31. Now we can clearly make an application to our lives. How are we hearing his word? Uh, we will really and truly hear God's word to the extent that we value it in our lives. That'll change the condition of our hearts. <laughs> Paragraph 32, we should, we should not miss the second of Jesus' threefold diagnosis of the hearer's spiritual problem with the words not perceive. Let's go back to Matthew 13 and look at those words words. We were looking at Matthew, uh, or we are in Matthew 13, and we want to look at verse 14, where Jesus says, in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled. So it was fulfilled in Isaiah's time, but the nature of prophecy is that it can have a double fulfillment and even a triple fulfillment. It was fulfilled at that time that Jesus spoke, but it continues to be fulfilled for, for every generation and every person that hears the word of God. So <clears throat> he says, um, let's read verse 14 again. In their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is being fulfilled, which says, you will keep on hearing, but will not understand. They are not understanding by the condition that their heart is in. This Greek word comes from orao. That's how it's pronounced. You could pronounce it oreo, but it's really orao. And had the idea of seeing spiritually. It's not a physical sight. <clears throat> it is a spiritual sight. Paragraph 33, the last of Jesus' threefold diagnosis of the hearer's problem can be seen in verse 15 in not making the effort to understand the rich truths of God. He says, the heart of this people has become dull. <clears throat> Let's read it again. Um, you will, verse 14, you will keep on hearing, but will not understand, and you will keep on seeing, but will not perceive. And then Jesus gives the reason, that word that when we see the word for, or uh, because of, that is a connective, meaning reason or purpose. And here's the reason that they keep on hearing but don't understand, keep on seeing but don't perceive for reason, uh, the heart of this people has become dull. 
<clears throat> that Greek word can mean fat or insensitive. And uh, with their ears they scarcely hear, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise they would see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and return, and I would heal them. The whole point there, the passage, is that that's what God wants to do all along, but he has to have the cooperation of people who, who are created in his image and after his likeness. So, paragraph 34 in your notes, truly, this reinforces the idea that there is indeed a law of use, a spiritual principle of use in the kingdom of God. Remember now, this, this parable um, explains, it describes, it teaches what the nature of the rule of God is or the reign of God is. And the, at its very core, it's rooted and grounded in the authority of his word and in the blessing of people. And the people that belong to that rule and that reign, the, the goal that God has for us is that we flourish spiritually, that we prosper spiritually, and that that whole reign and rule is, is anchored in the word of God. That's, that's the authority of the kingdom of God. And so naturally the citizens of the kingdom ought to know his word and so that's the fundamental foundation of, of what the kingdom is all about and how it operates. It's through the word of God. So um, let me just repeat, let me go back to uh, paragraph 34 and mention this again. Truly this reinforces the idea that there is indeed a law of use in the kingdom of God that relates to every aspect of how it operates in and through you and me. And clearly in this parable, we see our Lord's expectation that our faith in Him continually grow and bear fruit. Well, paragraph 35, we do see God's heart expressed for everyone in His desire to reward. And we see that in verses 16 and 17. But it will be a reward only the disciples, and by extension, anyone willing to heed his words will receive. That's you, and that's me. Let's read verses 16 and 17. Uh, and contrast, every time that we see the word but... Um, that is a connective denoting contrast. And that's an important principle of, of observation in Bible study that we need to see. So with the simple word but, Jesus is introducing a contrast between the multitudes who have no heart uh, to enter into the kingdom, let alone live by it, and Jesus' followers. So he says in verse 16, but... Blessed are your eyes. And your is emphatic in the Greek text. In a sense, it's Jesus' way of complimenting them, reinforcing uh, their, their desire to know and live it out, encouraging them, and um, really laying down for them that they are truly his followers. So I love that. He says, but, uh, but blessed are your eyes. We would underline that in the text. Your. Because they see. You see, they really see. And the see is in the present tense, which means they see and they continue to see. And your ears, because they hear, present tense, and they continue to hear. For truly, and that's an important statement when Jesus says, for truly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see. Desired is, is in the aorist tense in Greek, which means just one time, just one time. They desired to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear just one time what you hear on an ongoing basis and did not hear it just one time. You see, the reason why I bring out the, the tenses 
of those verbs is to highlight the contrast that Jesus is giving and to highlight the, the infinite value that he places on his word, but that not everyone else uh, receives. So the multitudes didn't receive the infinite value that Jesus places on his words, but the disciples were. And the Old Testament prophets desperately wanted what the disciples got just one time. And, and it wasn't their time yet. <laughs> I, don't, I hope I can convey in words, Holy Spirit, help me, how vital the Word of God is for us, but also how vital that how vitally important it is for us that we keep our hearts <clears throat> in good soil so that the the seed of the word of god can take root and and bear fruit again 30 60 and 100 fold which is 3000% 6000% 10, and 10000%. You know if I said to you give me um $1000 and I'll invest it and you'll get a 3,000% return, I think you would give it to me just like that. And if you didn't have it, you would do everything you could to earn it. Or $100 or $10 or, or whatever it is. Uh, just $1. And I promised you a 3,000% um, growth or 6,000. You see, um, money is only temporary, but our lives our lives are eternal. Well, that leads me to paragraph number 36. Uh, thus, John Calvin is correct when he warns the critic who says, but doesn't God's word say that he will make his word clear to those who follow him? Um, and then I've given you some reference, references there. Isn't Jesus contradicting this? Paragraph 37. On the contrary, Calvin correctly observes the Word of God in its own nature is always bright, but its light is choked by the darkness of men. Isn't that good? That's a great comment. Uh, I think I need to tweet that a little bit later. The Word of God in its own nature is always bright, but its light is choked by the darkness of men. That's powerful. Paragraph 38, God is a covenant-keeping God who promises, promises blessings to the obedient, but curses to the disobedient, all from the same word, all from the same word. And there you have the references there. Let's stop and pray. Heavenly Father, please forgive us for not taking your word seriously. Please forgive us for our own disobedience. Please forgive us for any and all carelessness that has been exhibited and demonstrated and manifested in our own lives. Father, I am acutely, painfully aware of my own disobedience. But your word tells us there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. That is, that we won't take advantage of your forgiveness and treat it lightly. And so we ask you to forgive us, cleanse our hearts, and we thank you now that if we're asking sincerely, you are forgiving. And your word tells us if we confess our sins, that you are faithful and just and will forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I'm thinking of that, that promise also that's even more powerful in Isaiah, I think it's 44, 23, where you say, I, even I, have wiped out your transgressions for my own sake and I will not remember your sins. Father, we thank you for your covenant of mercy and grace with us, and it's all based upon the blood that you shed on the cross, Lord Jesus. And Holy Spirit, we thank you that you are applying that to us now uh, for the glory of the Father and of the Son and the upbuilding of the people whom you love. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. That verse that I quoted from Isaiah let me just um, 
let me make sure I'm, I'm pretty sure it's Isaiah 44 uh, verse 23 but let me make absolutely certain it is it is um, well I'm not seeing it seeing it is verse 22 I think I said verse 23 it's verse 22 listen to what this promise says it's extremely powerful I have wiped out your transgressions like a thick cloud and your sins like a heavy mist. Now that's not the verse, it's very similar, but that's not the verse that I was quoting. That is in Isaiah 43, just one chapter earlier, and it's Isaiah 43, 25. If you have your Bibles, turn there with me. Isaiah 43, verse 25 and listen to, listen to the passion with which Yahweh speaks and the emphasis. How do we know it? emphasis? Because he repeats, his, some, he, he repeats the word I twice. I, even I, am the one who wipes out your transgressions for my own sake. And I will not. The Hebrew word there is not under any circumstances whatsoever remember your sins by the word by the way the word transgressions is is just open rebellion against god sins is a general uh a word for for sin the, the hebrew word for sins is just a general word for sin it includes all sin but transgressions is that is willful disobedience that is we we know that it's sin we know that it's wrong, and we willfully do it anyway. But God, in His grace and mercy, has made provision, even in that, to forgive us of our sins when we are humble enough to ask Him uh, to forgive us of our sins, and then our hearts are to obey Him. Now, we may have to ask for forgiveness for the same sins a thousand times, but as long as we continue to ask, that the Holy Spirit will, God will forgive us and the Holy Spirit will work Christ-like obedience in us. Isn't that, isn't that incredible? Isn't the Word of God exciting? And again, for my brothers and sisters in uh, Siaya, Kenya, uh, Nyesai Ber, Nyesai Duong, Amen, Opak Ruof. Opaki Yesu, Yesu Opaki, and we could say uh, to our Lord, Ero Kamano Ahinya, Ero Kamano Ahinya. That means thank you very much. And Opaki Yesu is praise the Lord, uh, Yesu Opaki, something similar to that. And Nyesai uh, Bear, God is good. Nyesai Duong, God is great. And I just love that Lua word for God. And as I've said to you all in CI so many times, um, God, the word God, that's one thing. But when you say Nyesai, that's, that's a powerful word. I love it. All right, let's continue on with our study. Uh, paragraph number 39 in your notes. For practical application, let's consider some additional thoughts from uh, verses 10 through 15 that we've read through in Matthew 13. Uh, Leon Morris, one of my favorite commentators, concludes, he says, life will hold just so much. And these people fill their lives with so many good things that there is no room for spiritual fruit. That blank there in paragraph number 39 is spiritual fruit fruit. That's a great assessment, isn't it? And uh, paragraph 40, doesn't this statement describe the condition of our society today? Too busy for God. And even so many in the church of Jesus Christ. So I ask the question, how does the parable thus far compare with the church today and with your life? My brothers and sisters in Siaya, Kenya particularly, those of you who are, as I've said already many times, those of you who are engaged in pulpit ministry, please take
take your people through the parable of the sower. Please teach them how to hear God's word. Please teach them the importance of praying before you hear God's word. And, and then continue to emphasize that and watch their growth. Now, um, we move on to section number C in the notes, and, and then we actually move on to Matthew 13, verses 16 through 23. I've already read verses 16 and 17. Um, let's read uh, verse beginning in verse 18. Uh, he says, when anyone, when anyone hears, I'm sorry, I lost my place here. Oh, verse 18, he says, hear then the parable of the sower. In other words, he's explaining, he's not giving it all over again, but he's explaining the parable of the sower. And, and he's, he's doing that because the disciples wanted him to explain it. So he says, in verse 19, when anyone hears the word, hears is a present participle. Um, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom, again, hears and continues to hear the word of the kingdom. And notice that he calls it the word of the kingdom. So he's reinforcing the teaching of the kingdom of God. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, present participle, meaning that as often as we hear the Word of God, we are responsible to understand it. Yes, in dependence upon the Holy Spirit, but we have to make effort. And again, that Greek word for translated understand, um, is that suniemi? Um, let's see. Let's see. Um, I'm not sure. Let me bear with me here and let me look at uh, look it up in my Greek New Testament. I'm not trying to be a show off here. I, I've been blessed to be able to study the New Testament in Greek and I want to be accurate. So um, when anyone hears, hears the parable of this um, all the hearing ones of the word of the kingdom and do not um, understand it. Sunientos. Uh, the evil one comes. So the Greek word is suniemi. That is, um, it is, the word means that we are responsible uh, to put forth diligent effort to understand. And so that's what Jesus is saying. Uh, verse 19, when anyone hears and continues to hear the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and comes is in the present tense. So every time we hear, we can be sure that he's going to come and try to snatch that word away from us. And sure enough, snatches present tense away what has been sown in our heart. Uh, this is the one on whom seed was sown beside the road. First category of hearers. Paragraph 20, the one on whom seed was sown on the rocky places. This is the man who hears the word, continues to hear the word, and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no firm root in himself. The soil of his heart is not good, but is only temporary. And when affliction, when, not if, when affliction or persecution arises because of the word. What's happening, what, where, you know, the affliction, that's a normal course of life. Persecution, generally speaking, comes because the enemy is using people to persecute us. But when it arises because of the word, because of the importance, the value of the word, immediately he falls away. That's the second category of here. And verse 22, the one on whom seed was sown among the thorns. This is the man who hears ongoing 
the word and the worry of the world and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. Mark says the desires for other things. Luke adds uh, the pleasures of other things as well. And then, of course, in verse 23, um, the, the highlight of this parable, and the one on whom seed was sown on the good soil, this is the man who hears the word. The Greek word hears appears for the 15th time in this parable. And that clearly, it doesn't have a hidden meaning. It just is Jesus saying that one of the key aspects of, of fruit bearing is how we hear. And that's why he emphasizes that word here 15 times. He hears the word and understands it, sumiemi. He puts forth the effort, who indeed bears fruit, and brings forth, bears fruit continually, present tense, brings forth continually, present tense, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. So, koro in luo. Uh, I've already mentioned, we're, we're in paragraph, um, we're in letter C, and I've already mentioned that your in verse 16 is emphatic again over against the multitudes who failed to pursue the rich truths that God was generously offering them and so it is uh, today. Paragraph number two on the other hand we also see our Lord's encouraging nature to his own in complimenting and even rewarding them with more. In addition paragraph three he pronounces a blessing upon them with the word blessed. I didn't mention that before in verse 16, but blessed are your eyes. The Greek word makarios means happy or privileged recipient of God's favor. The, um, in paragraph, so that blank there, I'm sorry, the, the blank there in paragraph number three is privileged, privileged recipient of God's favor. Hey, God wanted to give the favor to the multitudes. He wanted to give his favor to the multitudes, but they didn't want it. But the disciples, his followers did, and therefore God gave it. That shows the generous nature that he has. Paragraph number four in your notes, it's interesting to note that Jesus has nine beatitudes in Matthew 5 uh, verses 3 through 11. There are nine gifts of the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians 12, verses 7 through 11. And we see the ninefold fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through 24. Paragraph number 5 in your notes, an additional reason the disciples are so blessed is that they have a far greater advantage with God than even the esteemed prophets who wrote. All, all under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the very words the disciples were so familiar with. And we see that in verse 17, which I've already gone over. Hey, let's think about this. Paragraph 6, the category Jesus mentions, of course, would be everyone from Abraham, Moses, Samuel, David, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and, and at the very least, all whom God called to write his word in the Old Testament. Many righteous men. I mean, that would be uh, even in Hebrews 11 calls Lot a righteous man. Noah. How about Elijah and Elisha? Um, how about Gideon? I mean, just the list goes on and on. And then paragraph 7, this may include the great women of the Old Testament. Because I think um, many prophets and righteous men is generic uh, for men and women. And of course, Deborah, for example, was a prophetess and she was a judge in Israel. And Hannah was a very, very righteous, uh, godly woman. Sarah is considered a godly woman. So I have in parentheses there, Hannah, Esther, Ruth, uh, Deborah, Abigail, um, etc., 
Paragraph number eight in your notes, moreover, it certainly includes John the Baptist, as well as perhaps Elizabeth and Zacharias from Luke 1, and Simeon and Anna, all of whom were dead uh, at this time that Jesus speaks. Finally, uh, paragraph number nine in your notes, in verses 18 through 23, Jesus gives a fourfold category of people and how they respond to his truth. Something that I've observed now to be all too true and accurate in the lives of people. Paragraph 10, do believers in Jesus truly understand the power of his truth? If we did, then wouldn't we be prepared first through prayer to always hear his word? Paragraph 11, what about those who preach and teach his word with a singular focus on prosperity, which is so prevalent in Kenya, throughout the continent of Africa, and hey, it's prevalent here in the United States of America and, and in all over the world. Is Jesus teaching the prosperity gospel anywhere in this parable? No, he's not. He's teaching about spiritual prosperity in the form of one of one's growth in maturity and in fruit bearing. Let me say something extremely important here, beloved. Please listen carefully. This does not mean I'm not saying that God is not interested in our uh, physical, material well-being. I believe he is. But when you look at every culture in the world where the full gospel is taught, everything, the whole word of God, the full counsel of God's word is taught and received, listen carefully, that society prospers economically. Now I know those of you in CIA, can you want economic prosperity? I want economic prosperity. But it doesn't happen overnight. You understand that. I understand that. However, as, as the people of God are taught the full counsel of God, including Proverbs, which has so many principles for economic uh, growth, as we're taught those, as we study those, as we receive the full counsel of God's word, that affects a society, and a society will grow economically. I will tell you the, 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 maybe the only reason, but at the very least, the primary reason for the economic su success of the United States of America is because when the gospel came to the United States, it took. The people um, received it well, and out of that came the, the Protestant work ethic, which was also in England and which the, the, the men and women of God brought over to the United States. And the Protestant work ethic is work hard, save wisely, invest, and be generous. That's the Protestant work ethic. But conversely, I know I'm going to make some people mad, and I, I, I'm not even going to apologize for it. In cultures where the gospel, the full counsel of God, has not been taught, and I'm going to say this boldly, in Roman Catholic cultures, almost without fail, you do not have economic prosperity. Exhibit A would be Latin America. Now, things are starting to change, but the reason for that is, is because you have had an explosion of evangelism in what are predominantly Roman Catholic countries, where where the full counsel of God has never been taught to the people because the Roman Catholic view is that the Bible is too complicated for the normal person to understand. The Protestant view is not that at all. The Bible, it, it, not that the Protest, it, it, it's not that Protestants are not saying there are difficult parts of the Bible to understand, but that's the job of the teacher is to open the Word of God and help them to understand that. But as... In Latin America, there's been an explosion of, of, the, of the teaching of the Word of God. Those cultures are starting to rise up and prosper more and more. Um, 
And, and so you have that all throughout the world. Even in China, China in a very short time will be the largest Christian nation on the planet. And in part, the reason why they're growing economically is because of the proliferation of the teaching of the Word of God. <clears throat> and so my prayer, and I want to stop and pray again for all of Kenya, my prayer is for um, there to be such a revival of love of God's Word and sound teaching of God's Word that it will absolutely revolutionize the nation of Kenya. And so, Father, we pray that you would raise up hundreds of thousands of men and women of God throughout the nation of Kenya and indeed throughout the continent of Africa who revere your word, who are not out for themselves, who are trained in principles of Bible study and sound interpretation, and then who will in turn disciple others um, in, in, in this, uh, in your word, so that, as it is so often said, and I'm not the one that said it, um, that Christianity in, in Kenya and in Africa is a mile wide and an inch deep. Uh, my prayer, our prayer, is that it would be a mile deep and a mile wide as well. And only you can do this, Holy Spirit. So we pray for your revival in this regard in Kenya and for awakening in the nation, the full counsel of your word in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Loved ones, is that a prayer that God wants to answer? You know he, you know that that's what he wants to answer. Hey, we need that in the United States of America. More and more preachers in our culture don't teach the word of God. And um, I'll leave it at that because that's a, a hot topic for me and I don't want to get off uh, on a tangent. Paragraph number 12 in your notes, from verse 19, we see clearly that the evil one, and note in Matthew 6, 13, where evil is literally the evil one, certainly understands and is threatened. That, that blank there in paragraph number 12 is threatened by the power of, of God's word. Paragraph number 13, Jesus teaches us in verse 19 that it is first the responsibility of the hearer to understand the word. Again, we've already seen the meaning of this word to bring forth careful effort, that blank there, careful effort in paragraph 13 to be discerning and wisely discriminating. Not discriminating in the sense that we use the word just to discriminate against another uh, person because of his race, but dis discriminating on what is good and what is not good, or what is necessary and what is not necessary. Moreover, paragraph 14, the, the word understand in verse 19 is in the present tense, indicating to us that our diligent effort to understand and apply the word read and heard must be ongoing. That blank there in paragraph 14, ongoing. Paragraph 15, likewise the word comes and snatches are in the present tense. Satan is relentless, that blank there in paragraph 15. He is relentless in his attempts to steal the word of God out of our hearts. Incidentally, paragraph number 16, uh, the word snatches comes from the same Greek word used to describe the rapture of the church in 1 Thessalonians 4, 17, which refers to an almost violent snatching or catching up. That word, uh, that blank there in paragraph 16 is violent. The Greek word is harpazo, harpazo. Paragraph 17, in addition, harpazo can mean to carry off by force, and it often denoted the emotion of a sudden swoop, and usually a force which cannot be resisted. That is how Satan comes to steal the Word of God. Isn't that amazing? Why? Because Satan understands the power of the Word of God, 
and the more people he can snatch it from, the more he can accomplish his work in the earth. Paragraph 18, thinking about these definitions <laughs> really ought to give us an extremely sober mindset about how even Satan understands the awesome power of God's word. Amen? Paragraph number 19, As so I want to ask the question, are we, are we as relentless, that blank there in paragraph number 19, are we as relentless in seeking out his word as Satan is in his effort and attempts to steal it from our hearts. Likewise, Robertson observes and warns of verse 20. I love this, this, uh, this statement, how quickly after the sermon, the impression is gone. And then Lane insightfully adds, to those outside, all must be in parable because it would be useless to teach them deep spiritual truths until they had mastered the elementary level. In verses 20 and 21, paragraph number 22, it appears Jesus is teaching on the sense of urgency that one must have regarding the word to get it deeply into his heart and to guard it and to obey it. And then I've got um, in parentheses there um, Proverbs 4.23, which says, um, Guard your heart, uh, keep watch, guard your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. Paragraph 23, if the hearer in this second category does not diligently do the above, he will not have a firm root in himself, and therefore he will not be able to stand when, as I mentioned earlier, when affliction or persecution arises because of the word. 